We're going to be covering chapter three, and this is structuring your project. Everything about chapter three is related to uh, staging for the use of Golem. It's kind of a comprehension of the Golem package as a whole. So I wrote down four learning objectives. The first, first one is learn the Golem file structure for building Shiny apps. Now, again, this particular chapter isn't so much focused on Golem as a tool. It's really talking about the file structure that Golem accesses. The second is managing dependencies and namespace files. Uh, namespaces are a very, very key point. Um, you may also hear these called as linkages or possibly pointers. Uh, the namespace variable is just that, a pathway to another stored memory location. Apply proper documentation principles for app maintenance, use, and future development. Uh, Russ has already talked quite a bit about testing, uh, using test cases or building test cases as we develop. And then the last learning objective is comprehend the future use of Golem as a, as a service. Um, Russ, I wanted to, to complement your previous uh, statement from last week. Uh, you had said that you're kind of indifferent on, on whether or not to use Golem. You can see benefits, you can see uh, uh, not using it. Um, if you have a, a differing package control or, or, or a workflow environment that you deploy, uh, it's not a requirement to use Golem. It's just what the Tidyverse and, and the Shiny uh, apps uh, book club is kind of nudging us towards of, of development using this service. <laughs> All right, moving to the next page. So Shiny app as a package, we use the Golem as an op op opinionated framework for building production ready Shiny applications. We learn the basic now, the rest of the book relies on it. Uh, sorry, we learn the basics. That's why I said that was a textual er error on my part. We learn the basics now in chapter three, and then the rest of the book that we'll be uh, covering will rely on Golem heavily. So what is a production grade Shiny app? Well, we use one file or do we split it in two? There is a school of thought in relation to either having an app.r file or you have an app.r and a server, or sorry, a UI.r UI and a server.r and you split these two apart. Furthermore, we may even start to branch further into other management styles of package form to create those uh, files. I would say that uh, based on chapter two, you always want to reduce down to the smallest scale for management of that project as a whole. Okay, try to, to get it down to its smallest elements of, of likeness, and then you can uh, modify or touch each one of those as a, a single set. We will discover this is an arbitrary question when managing large production level shiny apps. The arbitrary comment I'm making is, it's already implied, you should break this down into smaller segments. And those smaller segments allow for a larger, wider audience of collaboration. Maybe you've got a team of uh, workers, team of labor, where you can assign them different tasks as they build and develop. So being able to produce it in a smaller set, modularizing the code will be, to your, uh, will be your success factor. Um, it is metadata. So this could be, sorry, that's the, uh, I think it's heading level A, or ordered list A in our textbook. Um, it is metadata. This could include naming conventions, versioning, numbering, what the app does, maybe some text around what the app does, uh, who to contact when it breaks, and it will break. It's just inevitable. Uh, never, never presume that uh, from the beginning of a development of an app, infancy of an app, all the way to its maturity, something's going to break. <laughs> it's just going to be inevitable. You're going to have to scratch your head and figure out, maybe even use a different alternate tool uh, to achieve a, a test sequence or, or production sequence. Okay. Option two says it handles dependencies. Um, Golem itself, you need to handle them and handle them correctly if you want to ensure a smooth deployment of your uh, production. There's two particular unique files that we're discussing here, and that's the description file and the namespace file. The description file contains the packages your application depends on. So imagine this as being almost a, um, de uh, de it's a dependency uh, type file. Um, I immediately think of the uh, first initial uh, writing a script and you access all your different various libraries, right? Just imagine we take that top matter and then create our own separate files so that any other person uh, that may be accessing, using it, developing it, 
uh, they're already calling on those same packages again. The second is going to be the namespace file, and this contains the functions or packages you need to import. Um, Russ, am I confusing those two? Description, the description um, contains the packages and the yeah, namespace. Yeah, yeah. I mean, descri description contains uh, a lot more information than just that, it, you know, the, the title of the package and the authors and things like that. Um, namespace, it uh, contains um, functions and classes that maybe you export from your package or okay. that, that you, it, when it comes to, 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 to an app, um, it, it's, it's still good practice to be able to uh, distinguish the, the kind of high level exported functions from the you know utilities that those depend upon um but you also put in things like um uh the precise functions that you import from the packages that you depend upon i see okay and any functions that you might re-export so you might import filter from dplyr so that you can construct your own filter interesting that applies to your classes this is kind of mind blowing so for that as a new uh, function so, so yeah it's not i mean it's just it, it's just where you put um how you document which functions are going to be made available to a, a package user um, yeah, and which functions you depend upon from other packages? This may be mind blowing. Yeah, I, let me. We'll we'll get past this section and, and maybe chapter four. Uh, we can cover that uh, uh, possible use of those. I'm really actually kind of mind blown. I may be uh, answering a question that I've always had in the back of my mind for quite some time. Like um, I know that a lot of R is is written with C language. Uh, and, and so it's undertone of when I, you know, call on a package and then, you know, make a particular call, what is it doing in the background? Sometimes, you know, during the, uh, the uh, error output, it'll give you a, like a little code snippet that says, you know, this particular syntax. I'm like, I didn't write that, you know, where is that <laughs> coming from? I'm thinking almost the same objective here going on. I haven't done any of the packaging uh, cohorts or, or anything related to that yet. So, okay. Um, it does split into functions. So what app gets is big, spread the wealth to smaller manageable files, the smaller the files go into the R directory. And I think that's a, an error in my syntax that should be a backslash or forward slash R, uh, not the way I've got it written currently. Uh, the R directory is, is kind of the storage of where all of those um, uh, points go, those smaller files that we will uh, talk about. When we relate to documentation, um, I state here and this is a repeat from the from the text uh, document 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 um, even in software development uh, with our data science or this shiny app development workflow you want to document everything and it's not just for your own personal needs it's also for the potential future collaboration of other team members uh, whether that be you know small uh, snippets inside your uh, function calls or if that's or your script files um, if that's documenting you know the use and the purpose behind this if it's uh i'm going to mispronounce the word i call it vignette and i know that's not right <laughs> but that uh those uh those smaller pdfs that uh represent um what each of the functions do etc all of those documents can compile into other outputs that will support okay so we have our readme file a lot of times the readme file is just a welcoming page to what this package does, how it works, et cetera. Um, and in most cases, it is just a simple markdown file. Or if you could even say it, it may be even a R markdown file. Um, if, if you don't mind, and, and I'm going to, again, mispronounce this, it may be the way I'm interpreting it. I always call this big nets. What is the proper term for this? Or how do we pronounce it? Federica, do you want to do that with a kind of Southern European yeah. thing? Yeah. Uh Vignette. Vignette. Okay. Vignette. Um, it's. I think I'm. I'm. I'm putting too much emphasis on the G within this uh, uh, point. So vignette. All right. Um, yeah. The function document. I, I think Sorry. it's vignette. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Is it okay? Okay. Good. Good. Uh, that's that's me being too naive with my uh, my language. 
the function documentation could include inline notes. Uh, you may even create a package down uh, web page for IT and other developers. I'm very interested in multiple packages that do automation in the undertone of development. So book down, uh, a rendering R markdown documents, or if it's package down where I'm creating another web page that has all of my support uh, documents. I think it was with Golem or it may have been another service, but um, Mr. Headley Wickham had wrote a package down uh, link and I clicked the link. It took me to another area. I don't even know what the web domain was that I was at, but I, uh, I learned that that's kind of what package down does for you is give you this alternate uh, flow. It's not just a CRAN page that you're, you're reviewing, uh, but it's a, it's a more eloquent or more user-friendly way of, of viewing it. Okay. And then finally, it's tested. Nothing should go to production without being tested. Nothing at all, ever, ever, ever. Don't ever put anything into a production grade that hasn't been tested. Uh, you are assured to break something if that happens. Um, it also <laughs> has a lot to do with security. <laughs> go ahead, Russ. No, it's nothing. It's just that I, uh, every app I work with, because uh, everything co that comes into me is is untested. And, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, so things are, <laughs> things are happening. To deploy to, it. I, do, I do try my best to improve yeah. them, but uh, yeah, uh, I, you can't be a stickler for that kind of stuff because you'll end up well, not working on anyone's code. But uh, <laughs> I, well, I don't know if you if you caught a, a news article in the RStats feed or not. Uh, Mr. Wickham had posted about Travis CI. So Travis mm. CI is your CI CD process on GitHub. And they said that uh, uh, with this particular nuance, what was occurring in this, if you're using Travis CI, the comment currently is don't use it, uh, try, to, try to figure out a way to stop using it. Um, the, they were taking secure, uh, uh, like security keys and then putting it into the actual package itself uh, during the uh, CI CD process, uh, the development process. And uh, it was exposing in a public repository, all these secure keys. And that uh, there's a there's a hearsay going back and forth of of how that actually happened, but um, I don't use GitHub other than with these cohorts. I actually usually am more reliant on Git GitLab instead, but um, that's a personal choice. I would never yeah, yeah, yeah. tell anybody not to use GitHub. Yeah, um, it's funny because Travis, um, I did use for a lot of packages a while ago, and because it was in a um, course that I followed um, I and then they they stopped they made it very hard for open source packages to um to to they made it a bit of a burden to use Travis CI for open source packages I see and, and, and so I I stopped using it but only like in in that I no longer really touch those rely on packages it. that I was that were dependent on Travis and have moved everything else to GitHub actions. Um, but this security thing, I mean, I was, I, I was thinking about it and I was, you know, a lot of the stuff that I do with GitHub actions for deployment of apps and things like that, I don't really know whether, uh, how secure it is, you know, if I'm sending over a secure, a security minded, you know, a, a key that shouldn't be released to say, yes, shiningapps.io. I don't really know that people who have access to the back end of shiningapps.io can't get my security keys and things like Correct. that out of there. Um, Correct. But yeah, that was quite interesting to read, but I don't quite understand the story. But yeah, I see. Uh, yep. Yeah. Uh, the next one uh, so it's, uh, it says that uh, we have test hat. As an option, examples could include using a test hat op, uh, application. Uh, again, the first thought that comes to mind is this CI CD process. So we we compile our code, we you know deploy it to uh, GitHub, GitLab, or some other uh, service. Uh, uh, what is the Jenkins type uh, Ansible or whatever workflow? It processes for us and then automatically hosts up. During that sequence, there may be some test that is run linter maybe on the code to error out and give us some uh, credibility. I don't know anything about the test hat package, so I'm gonna leave it there. And hopefully within the time of this book club, we may touch it in the future, I don't know. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, the later chapters of this book, they talk about um, a couple of other tools that are quite helpful for, because test that is fine. And, and, and I, I think it's shiny test as well. We, we, uh, able to work with the server code for your app but they don't really have the ability to um, drive the javascript reactivity side of your app I see. so there's a, a few other tools that are mentioned later on which probably would be uh, probably uh, uh, are quite interesting to me that, that that I haven't seen, but test that is yeah. I mean this this is like the the, the kind of standard testing package now for our packages and and whatnot. But yeah, very good. Yeah, uh, there is a native way to build and uh, build and deploy it, and then finally create a tar gz file. That's another option if you want to project the. Uh, uh, project uh, into another form. TarGZ would be a way of wrapping it and, and deploying it to another service or to another developer. Uh, makes for easy distribution. Okay. Uh, the resources, uh, I copied these links and, and provided them in this uh, uh, package with this commit or pull request that, uh, that uh, Russ, you, you had activated. Um, these links would be available in that same presentation as well. Okay. Mo moving on to the next, we have our modules. So modul modularizing code will be your success factor. Um, when we look at modularizing, uh, the 1 million validate buttons problem is the uh, example that the author was providing to us. Uh, creating small namespaces where you can safely define IDs without conflicting with other IDs in the app. When your single app gets bigger, UI and server exchange may be hundreds of thousands of lines of code uh, apart, and this uh, intends to be a lot of scrolling. So by providing uh, a mechanism to author or to name that particular uh, point in your code makes it a little easier to manage. Okay. So working with a bite-sized code base, uh, there's a, uh, a quote I wanted to have. If you copy and paste something more than twice, you should make it a function. That is probably with any uh, software development lifecycle or software development uh, uh, production level. If you, if you have to continually copy it over and over again, you might want to just create a function to do that. So you just call on the function instead of copying and paste over. Uh, Federica, uh, John Harmon had given us a, uh, an example. I don't think it was last week or the week before. It may have been three weeks ago, but there was a, a keyboard shortcut that he had showed us in the R4DS cohort uh, where it copies the previous block of text over again. And this kind of makes me curious, like maybe that's what that particular developer was doing. Um, at any rate, I'll try and find the example that he was giving us because it is something that's partial to that, that uh, quote. Uh, shiny uh, modules aim at three things. We simplify the ID namespacing. We split the code base into series or functions, and then we allow the UI server handshake parts of your app to be reused over again. If you write it as a function object-oriented programming, then you're able to just call on it over again. The first thought that comes to mind in this example would be uh, CNH file handshakes, right? Um, I have my definitions file and then I have my functions file. When I'm in the main uh, point of my C programming or C++ programming, I just call on those previous C files that I generated. Python's no different, packaging and R is no different either, okay? Most of the time modules are used to do the, uh, uh, do the two first steps. In our case, we could say that 90% of the modules we write are never reused. They are here to allow us to split the code base into smaller and more manageable pieces. Um, I do a lot of web development in my day job. And so uh, I just got off a phone call a moment ago where I was explaining that you don't create a linear document from top to bottom. Instead, each heading level is its own file. And then we go through a, a, a distiller or a, or a compiler that produces an output of PDF or web server output or whatever the, the output would be. My point being in that argument would be make it as smaller and smaller and manageable as possible so that you can do other more eloquent management of that package. And I, I know I'm being very vague with my statements. Okay. 
when we use shiny modules, uh, they start right from the beginning. Yes, this takes a bit more time to start off with. Russ, I, I know I'm repeating myself, sir. At the closure of our at the closure of our last week's session, we were talking about modularizing. And I think this is probably where we stopped at. I had to run off to another meeting, but um, this point that you were making comment on this modularization thought process is uh, uh, starting from the beginning. And your comment is, it sometimes it may be difficult. I'm building the Shiny app as a proof of concept. I don't wanna, I don't wanna ingest this large workflow of extra steps that aren't really important at this point in time. The author is attempting to reinforce and say, if you start off on the right foot, you're going to be better in the long run uh, instead of two to three months down the road having to recreate all of this uh, uh, over again. So uh, it says your future self will love you. Uh, a practical walkthrough, uh, big uh, code based example, talk through the best way to compare um, this point. And I think that's a note for myself. Um, your first shiny module two is passing arguments to the modules. And then there's a use link uh, that takes us, it looks like to think R uh, and gives us a tiny Tuesday uh, shiny app. Uh, I think this was one of the book clubs, uh, Frederick, you're back with us, but the uh, this example of the tidy Tuesday uh, example had a bunch of extra tabs across depending on the plotting that we wanted to uh, work with. Uh, and so you're taking your shiny app and you're putting it into these different uh, arenas or, or, or different areas, giving focus to that subject matter at the time, instead of being a one size fits all. So uh, if you would like me to go to that link, I can. Yeah, sure, we'll have a look at it. Okay, yep, yeah. all right. Uh, this will take me away from my previous, but that's okay. What, uh, what we were talking about, this was a, a October 15th, 2019, uh, developed by ThinkR uh, as a, a service, a, a group think tank that was uh, related to R. And they had a bunch of these tabs across the top. And I thought this was really cool that they separated the focus of attention of what the user was trying to get at. So if we look at the data set as an example, I guess that's this page. Um, they're using the big empty cards data set. Um, we've got some different links uh, showing the, uh, the, the pointers, uh, histograms, box plots, and then barcode, and then click to display the variable dictionary. If I extend that, all right, so that, Russ, was your comment about reactivity. Uh, that was a drop down menu. Previously, that code was, was hidden from the uh, web page, and then by me clicking on that, uh, it extended and, and allowed me to see all the variable names and the definitions of what those variables are. Okay. Yeah. Uh, if I go, if I move over to a different tab, um, here we get our classic shiny uh, left bar uh, uh, plotting, and then a radio button option to render the plot. So by taking it as as default, um, let's see if this will work. Yep, there we go. So now I can change this if I want to change my background theme to say, let's say classic. I just render the plot again, right? That server UI app, oh, sorry, UI to server handshake uh, by me making these different selections and then uh, commanding the render plot to go do some activity on the server's end. As of recently, uh, I'm starting to learn a little bit more about this download button. Um, so you can use GG save or some other render, but uh, uh, if you provide this code, you could download this plot in a form that you could add to extra documentation. So uh, histograms would be a different plot form. Yeah. And again, I'm and just so within, within this app. So this is as a, a an example of how to split up a large app into manageable components so each of That's those correct. like the data set and the geom point and the geom hist at the top mm -hmm. would correspond to a kind of top level module yes. and then within that say the geom hist that you have at the moment would mm -hmm. call a um a, a module to define the parameters for the plot and a module to show the plot and possibly the download Correct. a separate Correct. thing that's used by multiple modules or something like that yeah it's and i neat. yeah what i found what i found most respectful to this example 
if you go to the about page and then they will take you to their GitHub link. Mm. So this particular Tidy Tuesday think our uh, distribution, right? One of the attributes of Tidy Tuesday is to be able to share your code base with others so that they can learn and, and develop further. If I go to the source code of this uh, point, you're going to find that they're using, I think, Golem uh, as a package manager. And then here is all of our folder structure of where they're putting stuff. We made reference to the R file. So inside here would be all of your R functions, right? And so the, the, the ID... Well, I, I had you in mind, Federica, from your conversation last week on just using GitHub and the branching and merging concept, the exchange okay. that you and I had. This really struck at home in being able to manage all of this content in a global setting, right? Um, you can't, it, it would be too much to ask a single person, right? They could probably follow all the different file structure and, and different naming conventions, et cetera, or Let's just use a app that does this for us, right? Or this this Golem package that does this for us. Exactly. I don't know. Yeah. Can, can you put the the link uh, in, in the I sure chat? can. Yep, yep, I sure can. Uh, do you um, want this Git, GitHub link or do you want the Tidy Tuesday link? Yeah, maybe this, this Tidy Tuesday and then there's, um, I'll be able to find the other links inside. Okay. I sure can. Um, Let me I've, drop that I've in. lost you before when you were saying things about what John has did what, and then uh, I've lost the line. So I don't That's know what. It. I almost gave a uh, link to something Chrome was doing, <laughs> something weird. There we go. Uh, it would have it would have taken everybody to my timesheet uh, for for work. Um, the uh, so I just dropped that into our chat. Federica, okay. if you don't mind asking that question again, I'm sorry. Sure. No, I will say uh, I've lost the line because my internet connection just stopped by itself. So I had to reconnect myself with my mobile. And okay. I've lost the bit that you were mm, saying things about, uh, I don't know, that John's, uh, John uh, uh, may, uh, have, has made some questions. I don't know. Then I've just lost the bit. But I'm we, sure it's all fine. Well, it was the discussion at the close of last week. We were talking about modularizing or the necessity if we begin a app development for a shiny app, and then the book or the authors are telling us to incur all of this additional workload of documentation and, and using package management and Golem and everything else. Like, is it really a necessity? Could I just quickly get something out the door just to prove what I was after and then figure out later? The choice of where to go with that or the, the, the debate that, that Russ had brought up at the closure of last week was it's not always a necessity, right? So don't just immediately incur the workload if I have to go in and develop a shiny app that I have this you know two or three hours of documentation typing that I have to do. That's not a requirement. It's, it's more towards the mindset that I've got to do some homework in the background to support the app that I'm going after if it were to become a production level service. And that's what the author was trying to, to comment on. When you had dropped off, I had mentioned starting off on the right foot. So knowing that the access is there uh, and then possibly incurring that additional labor to to author those additional uh, package, uh, sorry, description file, R file, Golem packaging, et cetera, right? Incurring all of that additional cost may be a requirement if you, if this were to become an enterprise grade application, a larger team of collaborators, not just one single person. Does that help, Federica? Yes, thanks. Okay, you bet. Um, when we look at a practical walkthrough, uh, the statement says a big code base as an example, and that's the link that we, we had. Uh, I dropped that link into our chat window, so that should be available for us in the future. Communication between modules, the three primary ways to share data amongst modules include returning a reactive function, and that's going to be in the Mastering Shiny book if you want more uh, definition of what a reactive function does. Um, I'm going to uh, just, 
say I can't speak that language. <laughs> uh, it's uh, strategy du pet 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 art. Petit. Uh, petit. Petit. Okay. Uh, I think that's a French uh, phrase. And then uh, the strategy du grand R6. And R6 takes on a, a, this next section they talk about more in relation to what R6 is. Returning values from the modules using reactive calls is costly on the server. So how can I best optimize my <laughs> user interface to my server exchange? How can I prevent those costly calls uh, for the server to crunch some numbers to redisplay it again. What can I do alternatively, right? Uh, using reactive, uh, so the, the strategy do that R says it creates a, a pseudo database shared amongst modules. It is more efficient, but it's not an eloquent way. It's a very hard coded uh, uh, roll up your sleeves and, and, and we're gonna create this infrastructure of data exchange. If you go to the R6 point, now we're going to use the R6 package. The uh, and Russ, do you want to expand on that topic if you're more Ooh, familiar with it? I'd love to, but okay. I'm not so uh, experienced okay. with R6 to be honest. We, um, I, I look forward to the future of this book club where <laughs> we may discover a uh, uh, an opening that we've never known about yet, uh, and yeah. and 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 be able to deploy it. But they said it actually builds the best of both worlds. If you follow this thought process or use the star six package, it combines both the first one of reactive calls being overly costly, and then the uh, secondary, uh, uh, just using the uh, uh, pseudo database instead. The first thought that comes to mind, and I don't know how far off the beaten path we want to go on this subject, but the first thought that came to mind when I was reading this section of the, the packet or the, the, the book was the differences between Engine X and Apache. So in the Apache web server framework, it is extremely efficient at hosting PHP code, right? Or, or it's extremely efficient at presenting media. It is horrible, horrible system when you start to increase your user base or the threading on the web server. PHP and, and Apache does really good with, with presenting media, but it does not do a very good job of optimizing the uh, amount of threads that the server creates. When you switch gears and you go the other direction and you have an Nginx server, well, Nginx isn't really that great at serving PHP, but it does do a extremely efficient job at multi-threading. So what you do is you create a reverse proxy. So all of your web servers, Okay, everything that you have in your infrastructure is all using Apache to serve up PHP. And then you have a front manager of all the multi-threading piece, which is running Nginx. And so this hybrid combination actually creates the best of both worlds. So you're able to, all of the, the data exchange uh, post and, and gets from, a, from a, a web user to the server itself, it hits the Nginx server first. The Nginx server, routes those threads to the various back end of all of your various web servers, which are using PH or using Apache instead. So the hybrid combination gives you the best of both worlds. And that's ultimately why I'm saying this uh, R package gives you the best of both worlds. That's why I immediately think this is the route we need to take. Okay. If we start to engineer shiny apps and manage the cost of exchange both reactivity and also data code or processing code this r6 package may be able to give us that best of both worlds right okay, okay. does anybody else want to add comments to that statement i may be creating a vague comment too i can provide you some use cases okay. yeah. i've found this on the internet uh, say uh, r6 is an implementation of encapsulated object oriented programming for r i see okay so it's a very simple faster lightweight alternative to r's built-in reference classes so okay. i'll put the uh the explanation in the chat Perfect. so the, the r documentation case uh, the fourth example the fourth example of this section is just using the tidy modules uh, function so um, everybody has learned or or uh, 
Russ, I'm complimenting on your introduction from two weeks ago, sir. Uh, the difference between base R versus tidyverse, right? There's a really big school of thought. Uh, it's almost kind of a, a fracturing between uh, different users on do we use base R calls uh, because that's what I'm familiar with, or do you want to be a new developer and go with this tidyverse uh, mindset? There's not really any right, wrong, or indifferent path to tell you whether it should or shouldn't be. Uh, it's just in existence. And so it's kind of a, what do you feel uh, more comfortable with? So as we look at the engineering of an application or the management of a larger team of people introducing this, that may be a school of thought that could provide bias in uh, what direction your code base uh, looks like. Uh, yeah. We always learn that uh, once you start writing in a format, you stick with that format the whole time. With the yeah, pipe yeah. command within the tidyverse, then continue using that code base. But when you start to mix and match, yeah, that's no, where everyone I, starts I scratching their head. I mean, there is a worry there, though, like because I imagine most shiny developers would be comfortable doing point one on this list. But if you restrict yeah. yourself to just working with reactive values, then you may be missing out on uh, a more elegant solution, even if it means that some people joining your team may struggle for a couple of days um, to get up to speed. But yeah. I may be coming at this subject from a different thought process too. When we talk in web development as a service, it has to do with the speed and efficiency of providing information to the user, the client, the document object model, the browser. And so if you incur a very heavy workflow on the server side or this you know, PHP slash multi-threading Nginx thought process I just introduced, what you're looking at is the time gap of sending a message to the server and its immediate reply and refresh. If it takes a long time, you're gonna lose your user's attention right? This is a horrible website. Why do I have to, to you know, uh, work with this? By elegant or eloquent, either term, uh, by using different models, different ways in which we could author the media and optimize that code base, now the service becomes uh, much faster in, in uh, speed and efficiency. It, it's, it, you, you can go brute force and just get a bigger server, that's one option, but that costs a lot of money, right? Or you could just be better suited with your code base so that smaller server that you are using uh, is still running at the same speed. Uh, maybe a different thought process, and I'm sorry, I'm mm -hmm. kind of going off the deep end here, but um, another argument that I've, I've been fascinated with as of late is the uh, 1980s and 90s, 2000s of, of using an Intel uh, a server, uh, Dell, HP, or some other vendor, and you've got this server rack that costs $10,000, right? It's got these really like 12, you know, 16 core CPUs, you know, and it's, it, it costs so much money or, or better yet, I'm going to buy, you know, a uh, uh, hundred Raspberry Pis of an ARM processor. And it only costs me, you know, a couple of thousand dollars to build the same speed and efficiency of that $10,000 supercomputer, right? It's, it's kind of like the Formula One thought process. I can spend millions of dollars on a Formula One car or I can build one on my own, but would still be able to compete with that Formula One vehicle. Does that make sense? And that's really what these different points are, are making. I, I, I hope I'm yeah, yeah. being supportive. Uh, there, uh, is it uh, Diraj? I want to pronounce your name properly. Uh, you were given the, yeah. the awesome oh. sauce. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so uh can i can i like introduce myself over here yeah, you go I, ahead I, sir yes you know you know, you know I, i've never been uh, part of any kind of a club or book club or whatever and um quite honestly i, I i'm really happy to meet you uh, uh federica russ and ryan uh, i'm dheeraj i'm located in uh, new delhi that's india it's about uh, 10, 15 p.m. over here. A little late for me, but uh, that's okay. Um, and, I, and, I, and I really liked, you know, what you just presented, Ryan. And uh, I would think that I'm... Uh, so I, I run my own startup, which is uh, 
primarily uh, i spent about 21 years by the way in the navy i wore a uniform for 21 years and i retired as a commander from the navy and i uh, and i now run my own uh, tech startup company which is i come from an embedded systems background and i you know we do a lot of simulators which are this has got nothing to do with data science and or analytics but uh, we also do data science and analytics and uh, and now um, you know uh, all the applications that we are building are primarily shiny apps and uh, you know i already have uh, some uh, uh, if you want to call it enterprise grade applications uh, but these are kind of already deployed and i'm now looking at golem and i'm uh, really fascinated by uh, what golem can do and you know and my experiences with golem and you know uh, and that's why i was saying if, if it's okay maybe i can share my screen and maybe walk you through what i'm doing and uh, what are my kind of uh, uh, you know uh, whatever that i find uh, is kind of good or bad or uh, things that i'm kind of struggling with and i'm yes. uh, I, i do post stuff on um, uh, Colin Faye's uh, GitHub, and you know, uh, with whatever I'm struggling with, and uh, but you know, on on the whole, uh, I I really find that Golem is definitely uh, the way forward uh, in terms of you know, productionizing shiny, and I think uh, and and all I've done is read the book that you know uh, what we're part of as far as this book club is concerned, and. Um, Yeah, so I'll be more than happy to kind of you know maybe share my screen and can I can I do that? I'm not very That's, sure. Uh, it's fine by me. Uh, you you have a little section uh, to finish. I do. To finish yeah. The chapter. Just, just, Would you like to do that and then we'll? Yeah, yeah. Please, yeah, please. it's it's not very far or it's not very yeah, much. Yeah, yeah. Uh, That's cool. Dharaj, if you if you want to give me just a second and I'll 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 close this up and then and then yeah, yeah we'll yeah, give the please. the last ten ten minutes to you. Please, um, please go ahead. When we talk of structuring your app, uh, the Shiny app has two main components. We have our application logic, that's the document object model, your browser. And then we also have the uh, business logic or the, the server side logic. Uh, and this components the, uh, provide the core algorithm and functions that make your application specific. So you always want to think in this thought process of what I'm protecting to the business, what I'm providing on the server's side, and then what I want the user to interact with, right? Uh, we talked about Travis CI and the security uh, calls of potential uh, compromise there. Uh, I've, I've mentioned optimizing or, or being very uh, uh, precise or, or almost, uh, there's a word that I'm looking for. It, it means to uh, refractoring or uh, uh, making your code uh, easier, simpler and, and more efficient in calls. So the thought process here is small is beautiful. And the term they're using is this repetita. And Federica, please feel welcome to correct me on my poor use of uh, foreign language. Uh, long scripts are all, uh, almost always synonymous with complexity when it comes to building software. So the thought that I always bring to the table when I'm, I'm discussing this with any user is, it's fine. If you want to make this really complex application, that's great. If it works, fine. But it's not going to it's not going to be present in an enterprise grade because you've got a larger team that you're working with. You can't expect everybody to comprehend what this really complex code is doing. Let's break it apart into these smaller functions and then be able to manage what those function calls are doing. Okay. Uh, the conventions that we follow in staging for Golem Russ in the future is the app.r, uh, typically the UI or app server, uh, contains the top level functions. <clears throat> we have our, uh, I don't know what FCT is, is that function? It's function, yeah. Functions. It's, it, it's, it seems like a, a poor choice in R because FCT always suggests factor to me, but obviously yeah. it wouldn't be uh, a factor. But anyway, sorry. Good, Good point. Continue, I, but yeah. The, the thought that I had was facets, and I know that's probably not correct either, but um, FCT as an acronym is, is kind of, yeah, misguided. But files containing the business logics, which are potentially large functions, they are the backbone of the application itself. Um, we want to make sure that uh, uh, those are added in the Golem with the add function name call. 
Uh, the mod file uh, contains unique modules. Many Shiny apps contain a series of tabs. Uh, Russ, to your benefit, or what I did here with this section, sir, is I literally just copied and pasted the text into this presentation. So um, yeah. there is probably too much uh, uh, stuff to cover here, but just remember the, the mod file is, is these unique function calls uh, that may go beyond uh, just a package itself. Okay. Uh, util, uh, utilities, uh, these are additional sub, sub services uh, within your application as a whole uh, containing utilities, which are smaller helper functions. The first thought that came to mind when I saw the utilities was like Node.js calls uh, possibly uh, Angular calls or some other JavaScript calls, things that may be not related to R as a service, but could be as a helper function when we deploy it in a web development environment. Uh, the UI itself, uh, for example, UI.R relates to the user interface. UI stands for user interface. And then the server call. The server file uh, contains any related applications to the backend itself. I like to think of uh, the our studio environment as it transposes or compiles into a shiny app, that particular handshake between all of these files and then what happens on the web server development deployment side of it. Um, if you use shiny IO, it's literally all of this is handled for you. Now that we're going to be developing this in our own, our, our own environments, uh, we may have to take this into account when we develop or deploy it in uh, a different uh, uh, service. As an example to Russ, uh, I do have my own RStudio web server and also my Shiny server. This would not be Shiny IO. And to relate to what I'm getting at here with these last statements is, I haven't found the easy way for me to use like a Shiny IO type call and know that it's going to a different area of my Shiny server, right? Shiny IO is, it's not proprietary, it's just doing specific calls, sending it to this web server. I'm wanting to comprehend or realize what statement I would need to make when compiling the web server output, how to migrate that to the web server and deploy it uh, without really thinking in a lot of copying and pasting files from one folder structure to another. I know it's possible, I just don't know how to do that yet. So I'm done with our presentation. Um, cool. Russ or, or 